Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Limited Level Ups. I'm Alex, and today's episode is a MKM card evaluation deep dive. So last week, if you were with us, we talked big picture stuff about the format, covered archetypes, top commons. This week, we're going to get a little bit more granular. I have a healthy helping of cards that I've set aside for us to talk about today to a little bit deeper than just your standard, this card is good, this card is bad kind of card evaluation. I think card evaluation in this set is a bit tricky, but I think that's a good thing because I think the reason that it's tricky is I'd say a lot of the cards in this set have dynamic and shifting values. They're not always just going to be static. This card is good. This card is bad. More so than in some other sets too. I think if you look at something like LCI, it was a little bit more like, yeah, this is a good card. This is a not so good card. It's a lot more about understanding the range that each card has and its ceiling and the card's floor and what you need to do as a drafter to reach a card's ceiling and of course avoid the card's floor. Usually by this time in the format around week two or week three, I get a pretty decent sense based on just helping people build their decks either on my twitch stream just you know doing deck tax or in the limited level ups discord what the most common mistakes or traps people are falling into and this time around the most common mistake or the most broad issue i think decks have just in people's initial build of decks is there'll be a card that they know is good they've heard is good maybe people have hyped it up you know to chalk outline might be a good example and in their deck, it just it's just not going to be good because they don't have the pieces that make it work. And conversely, there's a lot of cards that have a lot of niche applications that aren't good generically, but I'll kind of highlight them in the sideboard and go, oh, you've, you've got the perfect deck for this card. I think you should bring this in. This is going to be pretty good in your deck. So if you're somebody who's been struggling in this format, I, I would suggest that might be a, a good place to turn to. If you're just looking at cards that at static values, like this card is a C, this card is a B. I think to be good at this format, you do have to critically look at is this card good in my deck? Do I have the parts to make it work? Or is it just not going to function the way I want it to? So to make this a little more approachable, I've separated the cards I want to talk about today into five separate categories. Those being one, why is this card good? These are cards that I've got questions about on stream that, you know, they see on 17 lands. Hey, it's got a high win rate, but I don't really get what this card's doing, why I should play it. So we're going to talk about those cards. Two, build around cards and i'm using the term build around kind of loosely chalk outline like i mentioned a second ago the uh the green enchantment that makes a 2-2 and makes a clue whenever a creature leaves your yard like that's a classic build around enchantment style of card but there are a lot of cards in this set that don't function unless you have x number of things x number of synergy cards that that make those work so we're going to touch on those three I want to talk about top player cards. These are cards that if you look on 17 lands and filter by top player data, cards that are performing much better in the hands of good players compared to the rest of the community. So just to highlight why these top players are winning more and what they're doing with cards that some other people might not be doing. Four, I want to talk about a handful of niche cards. These are those cards I mentioned a second ago that aren't very good generically, but in certain decks, when you've got certain cards, you can slot them in. And finally, I just want to talk about a handful of rares that I thought are kind of interesting to talk about. And as always, just before I jump in, I do want to give a very quick shout out to the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited level ups in addition to supporting the show which of course we very much appreciate it helps the show keep going among other perks you get access to the patron section of the limited level ups discord which like i mentioned a second ago i'm there every day doing deck text just send it over to me after you've done a draft i'll be able to give you a second set of eyes give you an opinion on the build basically set your best up for your game so you can win more games and you know there's also just like a ton of great discussion going on over there i think it's a lot of great value if you do want to level up your game if you do want to get to that next level i would really recommend it i know a lot of people have said that this is the number one thing in the past little while that's gotten them better at magic so go check it out and like i said there are a bunch of other rewards over there as well on the patreon so if you like the show or you want to take that next step patreon.com slash limited level ups so just quickly before we dive into the actual cards i wanted to touch on how i'm engaging with 17 lands in this set because if you've seen my content before you know i'm a pre pretty big proponent of using 17 lands to give you good baselines on how well cards will perform in your deck. I, th I think that's the best thing that you can get from 17 lands, just going, oh, this card's performing a lot better than I would have expected, or this card's performing way worse than I thought it would be, and kind of just calibrating to that. And I do think that's still useful for this set, but I'm using 17 lands a lot less often to kind of guide what kind of cards I would want in my specific deck. The reason for this is... 17 lands inherently it's an aggregator right it's telling you on average how well will a card perform in the average green white deck or the average blue black deck or the average whatever color pair deck in a given format and because i think there are a lot of cards with shifting values there's a lot of build arounds a lot of the color pairs can be built different ways 
a lot of my decks are looking a lot different from each other draft to draft. My green-white decks could look very different three drafts in a row. And so the game in hand win rate that 17 lands tells me for a certain card will less likely be accurate for how well that card will perform in my deck compared to some other formats. Like I mentioned LCI, I lost Caverns of Ixalan a few minutes ago. And in that format, I think if you were drafting the set for the first time and you didn't really know what was going on, you could kind of just go, you know, draft by numbers in a way where you just look at your pack and you go, okay, what's the best card in the pack? I take that. I took a good blue card. Next pack, what's the best card here? Okay, it's a white card. Now, you know, you, you find yourself moving into blue-white and the numbers you see on 17 lands will pretty accurately represent how well a given card will do in your deck. Because in that format, I felt like when you drafted blue-white, most of my blue-white decks looked roughly the same. When you drafted blue-red, kind of the same thing. You know, across all of my red-green dinosaur decks, I kind of just wanted a lot of the same cards because there weren't too many cards in the format that pushed you in the direction where you're like, oh, I'm doing something completely different now. Of course, there were the cave decks and those decks looked very different from each other, but for most of the color pairs, I would say this is true. This set's not really like that. Like I mentioned, a lot of my decks, even in the same color pair, are doing pretty different things or are building towards certain different incentives, right? It's almost like cube. You might hear sometimes people say 17 land stats aren't that useful for cube because cube's got a lot of these different synergies, a lot of these shifting cards where, yes, you can still tell what the best cards are, but there might be a not so great card that you're like, oh, it's actually pretty good in my deck because my cube deck's doing this weird thing that uh, really makes me want this card. You know, Vintage Cube is probably the greatest example of this where you have like these weird combos that uh, a Talarian Academy, that's one of the best cards in Vintage Cube, but you just put it in a random deck. It's not going to do anything at all. It's not going to tap for any mana. And so while this set isn't quite on the end of Vintage Cube or even an Arena Cube, that dynamic is still in play. So a lot of the lesser good cards, the cards that aren't performing well on 17 lands, sure, I will respect their baseline. I'm not just trying to say, oh, 17 lands is wrong, the, 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 good, the bad cards are good and the good cards are bad. That's not all of what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying there's a lot of room for not so great cards to be good in your deck. Even if you sort by color pair and you say, hey, that, that card's actually not very good in your deck. And I'll give you an example. I had a deck that you might have actually seen. I posted this uh, draft on the YouTube channel a few days ago. It was a green, white, go wide deck. I think I had seven, eight token makers. And usually green white isn't so much go wide. It's a little bit more of a, a red white thing when you have the, the persons of interest and the dog walkers, all that kind of stuff. And, and in that green white deck, I ended up splashing War Leader's Call, which is the rare anthem that uh, you know gives your creatures plus one, plus one, and whenever a creature enters the battlefield, it pings your opponent. And, and I had a really insightful comment from somebody uh, in, the, in the YouTube comments that said, hey, it's kind of interesting. Like if you splash this card in green white, just they were just looking at 17 land stats, it's much, much worse, right? It's just like way worse than it would be in red white and of course you know whenever you're splashing the card is going to be worse just by virtue of you need to play fixing sometimes you're not actually going to be able to cast the card anytime you splash a card it's just going to be a little bit worse than if it was in your main colors they noted that in green white when people splash the, the war leader's call it wins at about 56 percent which is like almost a full 10 percent less than it is in red white and my response to that was it's true i don't think that war leader's call is a great splash in most green white decks but my deck is special because i have a lot of of those token makers you know I, I had two killer among us right that that really pushed me over to the edge to be like hey this card is actually going to be pretty good in my deck like i imagine some people are just throwing that card in a green white deck without a lot of tokens or maybe just splashing it in a base green deck because it looks like a good card to them they know it's a good card and they're like oh i'm splashing i can put that card in so if you are engaging with 17 lands or just in general how you're thinking about building your deck that's the way i think you really want to think about it look at the specifics of your deck Look at the cards you might want to play and say, is this actually going to be good in my deck? Is it doing the thing that it, it kind of promises to do? Or are there certain specifics of my deck that make this card not as good as it usually would be? And of course, the opposite is true too. Sometimes there's cards that are not so good, but in your deck, they uh, they fill a specific role. And if this is like, well, I'm not exactly sure what makes a card good in my deck or, you know, what, how many of these things do I need to make this weird card work? That's what we're going to cover today. Hopefully, I can kind of push you in the right directions, give you some tools for figuring that out. All right, let's jump into the cards, shall we? So the first category of cards we're going to touch on is just a handful of cards I've gotten a lot of questions about. Cards that are performing quite well on 17 lands, but may not read as good as they actually are. And the one I do want to start with is a killer among us. This is the five mana green enchantment at uncommon. Enter the battlefield, you make a human token, a merfolk token, and a goblin token. They choose one secretly. Then you can sacrifice killer among us to put three plus one plus one counters on whatever creature you chose if that creature is attacking. Now, I, I do think that compared to last week, people are definitely catching on to this card, but I am still seeing this card fifth, sixth pick sometimes, which tells me that it's still underrated because I have this as 
top three uncommon in the entire set. I, I do think it's just fantastic. At a baseline, we know that cards that make multiple bodies for just one card are good. Multiple bodies means multiple options, multiple double block permutations. You can chump block with one thing and you know, you're not giving up a full card. So, so that's the very first thing that I think when you look at this card, you should see it's, it's a card that gives you three different game objects. Four if you want to count the killer among us. And yes, you're only getting three, three worth of stats for your five mana. But I'm much more willing to tolerate understated creatures if they do come across multiple bodies for all those things I just mentioned. And eventually, of course, you're getting 6-6 six, six worth of stats for your 5 mana. And 6-6 six, six worth of stats for 5 mana across multiple bodies is very strong. So I think a good fundamental approach for the next level of evaluating this card is just thinking of it in a few different kind of game states. You know, think about when you're behind, think about when you're at parity with your opponent, boards are about even and think about when you're ahead. Well, when you're ahead, it's just fantastic because if your opponent's way behind on board, they don't have as good of a board as you, you play three creatures and one of them's gonna turn into an attacking 4-4 death touch. Actually, I don't even think I mentioned that when, it, when I read out the card. The, the attacking creature also gets death touch, so it makes it very difficult to block. A 4-4 death touch is not something that your opponent can block very well, even if they have a big-ish board and they go, okay, well, I'm gonna make blocks so that it, no matter what they chose, I'm gonna have decent blocks. Well, no matter what, unless they just block with a single 4-4, four, four, or a single 4-4 four, four in all of them, they're gonna be losing two creatures if they choose to try to deal with the, the creature, the attacking creature that you chose, just with blocking. But anyways, if your opponent is quite far behind, the, the card is gonna be phenomenal, because one of the ways that you can come back from a behind position is just point a removal spell at your opponent's creature. You know, they play a big green creature or a bomb. Well, what are you going to do about that? You're, you're behind in the race? Well, you just kill it, right? That's, that's one thing you can do. And yes, you can remove the thing they chose, but then your opponent's still left with two tokens, and that really matters. But of course, being behind is kind of the least important game state we think about when we're evaluating something like this. So let's just think about at parity, when the boards are about even. Well, when the boards are about even, this comes down and stops the race, right? Your opponent can't really, they just have some big creatures. If your opponent attacks into you, then you, you block with the, some of the tokens that you don't care about. You have your other creatures back, most likely, and you crack them back with the 4-4. That just kind of shifts the math, the combat math over multiple turns. So that's a pretty good spot to be in, too. And then even when you're behind, it's not fantastic because you don't want to turn one of your blockers sideways. But putting three bodies on the board, that might be enough to get you over the hump to then come back next turn, right? It's, it's, it's a fail case. You don't want to be like, okay, play this in chump block, but that does give you an option that a lot of other cards wouldn't be able to give you. And, and the other thing is, again, when you're thinking about how does this line up against removal spells, well, sometimes you're hoping to stabilize and go, I play my 5-5 five because five, they've the biggest thing they have is a 4-4, four four, so they won't be able to attack into this, and they just have a removal spell. Well, you don't have that problem here. You don't just die on the spot. You do get another turn where you get to untap. And then that's just the beginning, right? You, you go a level deeper and you go, okay, well, this set is a set that really rewards going wide. There's a lot of cards that pay you off for having multiple creatures in play, whether it be on the job, the plus two, plus one, investigate, or get a leg up, single green mana, target creature gets plus one, plus one, at reach for each creature you control. Like, you know, the list kind of just goes on and on and on. And then you go a level deeper, and it's like, well, when you sacrifice the killer among us, it goes to your graveyard. And that's five mana worth of evidence while actually keeping other things on board. There's Case of the Shattered Pact, which is the colorless case that to solve it, you, you want to have five colors of permanence in play. Well, this is a green card, and it makes a white token, a blue token, and a red token. So you only need black, and Killer Among Us almost alone solves the case of the Shattered Pack. So, uh, again, you know, maybe I've even overstayed my welcome talking about this card, but I really just do want to hammer home how good it is, why it's so good, because I, I do think this is still underrated despite people now catching up to it being good. Next up, I've got a few evidence-related cards, and I was... Going back and forth between putting this in the top player section, because these are cards that are performing better for top players. I, I think mostly because a lot of top players are drafting green. But uh, first on the list here is Topiary Panther. So this is the 6 mana 6-5 six, trample that is basic land cycling for one and a green. So I talked about this card a little bit last week as well. And the whole joke with it, when you first see this card, you're like, oh, okay, it's a it's a cycler and you can put it in your graveyard and get 6 mana worth of evidence and you can go get your land. Okay, that's all fine and good, but... Two mana for a land cycler is still pretty bad. If you ever have to do that on turns two, three, four, five, and not affect the board, you're going to fall behind in tempo a little bit. At least take a little bit of a tempo hit. Like, it is a cost. Not a major cost, but it's a cost. You can sort of think of it like uh, public thoroughfare, right? That's the, the five color land that you need to tap a land or an artifact when it comes in uh, or else you sacrifice it. It's sort of like that. It's like two mana to go get your mana source. And I wasn't playing with this card very much until I, I really started drafting the green decks heavily. And even when I started drafting, 
draft in the green decks, I was kind of shying away from this because, like we've seen in the past little while, the, the two mana land cyclers, think about uh, to march in the machine. Two mana land cyclers do have that problem of just being a little bit clunky. However, you do gain back that tempo in a lot of ways when you go to cast a collect evidence card. So an example I'll give you, and another card that uh, I really like that I think is underrated, and I've seen people ask, oh, why do you like that card so much, is V2 Gazi Inspector. It's the two mana, one in a green, one three detective that has reach, and if you paid evidence as you cast a spell, you put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature, and you gain two life. So while you spend two mana to not affect the board with Panther, on a future turn, you can gain that tempo back by making your V2 Gazi Inspector be a 2-mana two 2-4 two that gains 2 life. So Panther fixes you, and then the evidence cards offset that tempo by being more than you would expect for the mana you're paying. Another example here is Extract the Confession. The one in a black sorcery, your opponent sacrifices something, but if you collect evidence 6, each opponent sacrifices a creature that with the greatest power they control instead. Same kind of thing. While you're spending the early game cycling a panther, and that means you might fall behind on board, while well, your opponent taps out, pays a 4-mana four 4-4, four four, you then get to trade your 2-mana for their 4-mana four 4-4. Four four. And I'm not trying to say the Topiary Panther is like, awesome, excellent, because there's a lot of ways to collect evidence otherwise. But it's a card that I'm happy to play in my decks that are collecting evidence, in my decks that are splashing. Ideally, you kind of want to be doing both. And before I really got into the groove of playing these green decks, I just assumed I wouldn't want to play this card. Let's talk about V2 Gauzy Inspector now. This is the 1-3 the reach. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. If you think about this card, if you've collected evidence, then it's a better Giant Spider, right? The giant Spider being 4 mana, 2-4 reach. You're kind, of, kind of a boomer card at this point. Actually, very much a boomer card, not, not a playable magic card. But it turns out that if you half its mana cost and add on some life gain and also make its power and toughness a little bit modular because you can put that counter anywhere it becomes pretty good and i've been telling people if you feel like you've been losing to aggro this is the number one card you want this is the card you want to bump up in your priorities because i'm going to be playing two or three of these i'm very happy to it's a fine blocker on turn two and then when you do get to evidence it on turn four or something two four blocker is really quite strong because it stops all the x1 creatures that a lot of the red white aggro decks have and it stops the flyers too and that life gain is a real just you know chef's kiss on top really just the icing on the cake okay up next we've got two black one drops fester leech and snarling gorehound fester leech is the one black mana uncommon one one then when it deals combat damage to a player Mill two cards and has the activated ability one in a black it gets plus two plus two until end of turn but you can only activate it once per turn so this one's pretty simple it's pretty good in either a aggro deck or a slower deck in an aggro deck it's a one mana one one that will consistently get in for one damage up until about turn four without any help because since your opponents are playing three mana two twos it's pretty difficult to block this profitably in the early game so your opponent just says okay you'll just you know i'll take a damage here take a damage here usually it's responsible for you know two to four points in the early game and most black decks have some desire to fill up their graveyard whether it be to collect evidence or there's cards like call a surprise witness in white the, the white reanimate a three mana cost creature or less and give it flying you know, there's a few things here and there where milling yourself actively does benefit you this card in particular actually i was just going through some 17 lands numbers and i was looking at where it gets picked on average and on average it gets picked around six pick and that's one of the biggest disparities between where it gets picked and the power level of the card or just the game in hand win rate where i think this is one of the more underrated cards if you're just looking at that comparison of how good it is and where it gets picked this card would definitely be worse if this wasn't a disguise format because when your opponent plays a three mana three two you're like okay i don't really want to play two mana on turn three to just trade with their three mana creatures but but again it doesn't really happen as often in this format and all the things i was just talking about with all the evidence creatures all the collecting evidence creatures how if you can enable them you you get to cast cards that are worth more than their mana value more than you'd expect at their mana cost well if you've just started the game with six cards in your graveyard like let me put it this way i would always choose to put the top 10 cards of my deck into my graveyard at the beginning of the game if i just had a button that could do that in my decks with a lot of collect evidence because then all of your cards are just above right your, your extract kills a great creature your v2 gauzy inspector is big every evidence card in your deck will just give you more than you should get quote unquote should get at that mana cost and then starlight gorehound is pretty similar this is the one mana one one menace that whenever another creature power two or less enters the battlefield under your control you surveil one I like this a little bit more in the aggressive decks, you know, uh, black-white aggro, rather than the slower decks, but it's still okay there. Where Fester Leech, I think, is good in both decks because you have the ability to block as a 3-3 in the late game. It's not like Gorehound stays a 1-1, so it's really just like an aggressive thing that, just like Fester Leech, will get in consistently for 2-3-4 damage. 
And this is actually a really important piece, I think, to the Black White Aggro decks. I want to start all of my turn ones with a Gore Hound or a Fester Leech because as the game goes on, you get to just keep, you know, clearing your deck of lands. And of course, you know, one of the, the problems with Aggro decks is at a certain point, you just don't want to draw a land five or six or something. And Gore Hound really solves that problem. Multiple copies, if you have multiple copies, your card quality is just going to be much better than your opponent's as the game goes on. And it's kind of a hidden thing. It's, right, it's something that you don't even necessarily clock when your opponent has one in play. But if they trigger their Gorehound three, four, five times, they're able to sculpt their hand better than somebody who is not surveilling once each turn. And they're going to have, as the game goes on, better card quality and cards that line up better for the particular game state, whatever that might be, than you will just based on that card selection. And of course, just like Vestal Age, it fills your grade for evidence stuff. And you know, even in like a black aggro deck, having your extract confession turn on early is a pretty good thing to do. Next is a pretty straightforward one. This is Offender at Large. This is the four in a red, five, four at common. It's got the skies for the same cost, four in a red. And when it's turned face up or enters the battlefield, the target creature gets plus two, plus zero oh until end of turn. I think this is actually one of Red's better common. It looks a lot like the clunky disguise creatures that you don't want to play or, you know, kind of would prefer to play 23rd cards, like the Crocodile or the uh, the Riftbrist Hellion, just like big dummies that flip up. The difference between this card and those kind of clunkier cards, of course, is it's expensive and it's a little bit expensive to flip up, but it has a good enter the battlefield effect and really helps you push damage. And any... Four plus mana creature that doesn't have an enter the battlefield effect is going to be quite a bit worse than one that does. And this is a pretty decent enter the battlefield effect. It enables an attack. It's a pretty big creature. Four or five is quite large in a format of three mana two twos. And also just the, the hidden of information of you, you play this face down and have this in a future date where you flip it up, win, maybe win two combats where this eat something. And then uh, creatures that might have bounced off each other, like a, a two, three and a one, three. Or, you know, your opponent double blocks, which is something that uh, they often do against the aggressive decks. You get to trade one of your creatures for two of those thing so just does a lot pushes a lot of damage and, and again this is a card i'm happy to play like one or two copies of the top end of my red decks and then lastly here just a bunch of combat tricks i mentioned these ones last week too and, and i do think that people mostly have come around to the fact that these cards are quite good auspicious arrival the two mana plus two plus two investigate the chase is on the three mana plus three even first strike and investigate and felonious rage the single red mana target creature you control gets plus two plus oh and haste and when that creature dies you make a two two white and blue detective token. And the reason I bring this up is I still have had some questions this week from people being like, okay, I look on 17 lands and I see these cards are performing quite well. They're like top 20 commons in the set. Is that just something weird going on or are these combat tricks like better than I think? And I think, yeah, the answer is the combat tricks probably are better than you think. I think for a lot of players, especially players who have been playing quite a long time and back when combat tricks weren't very good it takes some time to kind of calibrate to the idea that the way i put it is, is combat tricks aren't second class citizens you know like a good combat trick i'll evaluate basically as well as a good creature or a good removal spell i mean you have to consider your creature count you're not going to take seven of these in your deck with 13 creatures but as far as the card types i want in my aggressive decks i, I don't see combat tricks as worse than removal and a lot of times because they're more efficient or can gain you card advantage like the chase is on and the auspicious arrival they're actually better like i would choose to play all three of these cards over galvanize at least over my first copy of galvanize the efficiency that you get on something like Fel felonious rage puts you way ahead on tempo, makes it so that if your opponent was close to stabilizing on turn four or something, it just makes it so that, nope, you can't. I, I trade my one mana for your three. I stay ahead on board. And then the chase is on an auspicious arrival. You want to cast those a bit later. You don't really want to cast those on turn three or turn four because you want to keep developing your board. Felonious Rage lets you play a one mana trick and keep developing your board, although auspicious arrival does sometimes too. But as the game goes on, turns four and turns five and turn six, keeps on helping you attack and draws you into more gas okay we're moving on to category two here and this is the build around cards and like i said at the top when i say build around it's not necessarily like okay i'm gonna build my entire deck around it i'm more just saying these cards you shouldn't put in your deck unless you have some number of other cards that synergize with them and the number of cards that you need to synergize with them depends on what the payoff is and to figure out how many cards you want to be able to play this card a question you should ask yourself is how many times do I have to do the thing that this card is saying that it's promising before I'm happy with it? So I'm going to take Chalk Outline for an example. This is the one I, I kind of talked up last week. This is the three and a green enchantment that says whenever one or more creature cards leave your graveyard, create a 2-2 two -two white and blue detective creature token, then investigate. So I did a lot of deck text this week and I, I claim partial responsibility because I probably should have said this last week when I was talking about this card. A lot of deck text where people had Chalk Outline in their deck with three 
four, five ways to trigger it. And that's just not enough, especially a card like Chalk Outline, where it, it just does stone nothing. It's, it's a Pokemon card in your deck. It's not a magic card when you cast it and you don't have the cards that play well with it. Like, I, I was looking at some stats on 17 lands for this card, and truly atrocious. Like, under 50%, you know, in the aggregate, not looking at top players, it's winning at, like, 47% game and hand win rate. And I thought, okay, how could it be this bad? And then I realized I've seen a lot of chalk outlines on the other side of the battlefield, sometimes two, and the opponent never triggered it a single time. So I think what's happening here is people are just underestimating the number of cards you need to make the chalk outline work. To, to be happy with the card, you have to trigger it twice before it's good enough. Because if you trigger it once, well, you should just be playing the locks on eavesdropper instead, right? The three mana three three that comes with the clue. And so then the question becomes, okay, well, if I have to trigger it twice, then how many cards do I have to play to be able to do that? And I would kind of relate that back to splashing math, if you think about that, where if you need the card to trigger one time, and that's all you need to be happy with the card, then you can get away with like three or four cards, just like three or four sources for one splash card in your deck. That's kind of the splashing math we use. But with Chalk Outline, when it's two, it's almost like you're splashing a double pipped card and we know how hard that is. So really, I think eight at a bare minimum. And if this card was a creature, like it had power and toughness and it wasn't stone nothing, I would be a little bit more forgiving of it. I think really you're trying to aim for 10, 11, 12 ways to trigger the chalk outline to really be happy with it. Because if this is in your opening hand without a way to trigger it, or, you know, in the top 10 cards that you're going to see by the time you get to turn four, it's just an unplayable card. And you can use that math for this card, for any other build around, for any other set, really. If you need to do the thing one time, three or four, that's how many cards you need. If you need to do the thing two times, it's like, yeah, eight, seven, eight, nine. And then anything past that, if you have to, if you have to do it three times for it to be good, the vast majority of your deck has to trigger the thing or do the thing or whatever it is. Now, the math does get a little bit fuzzier here when you're talking about a card that may do something else. And an example I would I would bring forth is uh, Harry Dronesmith. This is the uncommon red creature, three and a red for a two, three human artificer. The beginning of combat on your turn, create a one, one colorless thopter token with flying. It gains haste and you sacrifice at the beginning of your next end step. So this is a card that I don't like to play unless I do have synergy with it, right? If you have the, the gear drakes that care about when you sacrifice things, if you've got the, the detective satchels that care about you sacrificing artifacts. It, it's just not a good enough card, right? Four mana, two, three, that deals your opponent a damage maybe each turn. That's just not good enough. And I've had a lot of people ask, oh, why don't you like that card? Well, that's the exact reason. Unless I'm not doing the thing, it's just worse than any other four mana card generally. But unlike Chalk Outline, I'm willing to fudge the numbers a little bit because it isn't just stone nothing. So it's a little bit of an art, a little bit of a science. For Dronesmith specifically, I think you need probably about three or four things that uh, that play well with it or else it's just not quite good enough, especially because the things that play well with it, unlike the chalk outline, can just get removed and kill your gleaming gear drake and you're then left with the drone smith which doesn't actually do that much insidious roots this is the black green enchantment that cares about the same stuff the chalk outline does is this creature owns you control have tap to add one mana of any color and whenever one or more creature cards leave your graveyard create an o1 green plant creature token then put a plus one plus one counter on each plant you control and by the way if you want a little bit more of a breakdown of how to make a chalk outline insidious root deck work check out last week's video the state of the format address i, I do actually go into depth didn't go into the numbers uh, exactly but the cards that play well that i talked about with insidious roots i think you need even more than chalk outline i think you do have to be in that like 11 12 13 things that trigger this card before you're happy playing it because if you just think of this as you trigger it twice it's a one two and a two three that's not that bad if you just if it was literally just two mana make a, a one two and a one and a two three that tap for mana that'd be great but that's going to happen a little bit later in the game, right? You're not going to be doing that on turn three, on turn four, on turn five. It's going to be, you know, maybe five or six. That, that's about when the earliest it's going to start, I would assume. If you're at that eight, you know, things that care, eight things that leave your grave, it's just not going to happen that consistently. And by that time in the game, well, the card's kind of lost a bit of its value. Yes, it's still going to be efficient. It's going to maybe a good double spell turn, but you're not that excited about the output. You want to keep churning creatures out with this. You want to keep triggering every single turn if you can. So yeah, with Insidious Roots, I'm even more picky you do want the vast majority of your spells to actually trigger this. Oh, and then one last thing about Chalk Outline and Insidious Roots. That, that's a little bit obvious, but this is another thing that I've uh, really mentioned and hammered home to a lot of people that have showed me their Insidious Root Chalk Outline decks. You really need to make sure you keep your creature count high. I would say about 16, probably 17, 18 at a minimum, because that's another thing that counts for, well, am I doing the thing? Because these only trigger off of creature cards. It's not just like an evidence card, which would maybe want any kind of card. It doesn't matter. It's not, uh, it's not contingent on what the card type is. 
you need to make sure you keep your creature count high so that when you're surveilling, when you're self-milling, if you've got any of that stuff, you're actually putting creature cards in your graveyard. Okay, next up, we've got Mox Ruby. Oh, no, so, sorry, Goblin Mask Maker. This is a single red mana common, one, two, that whenever it attacks, face down spells you cast this turn cost one less to cast. And this is a card that I was considering maybe even putting in the why is this card good category, because I do think it's a good card in the right deck. You just, once again, need to make sure you have the things that make it tick. And what makes it tick? Well, enough disguise creatures. How many disguise creatures do you want? You want to make sure that a Goblin Mask Maker, when that's in your opening hand, you're also going to see a disguise creature in your top 10 cards. Because I think if you do trigger this just once, it's done its job. It's kind of it's kind of like a Lana or Elf at that point that, that casts one of your disguised creatures early. That's okay. And to see a disguised creature in the top 10 cards of your deck, I would say your minimum is four. The more the merrier, of course, but four at a bare minimum. And I would say that another requirement, which isn't too hard for red decks, this is kind of something you're already doing, is uh, you also want combat tricks so that this doesn't just a dead card as you keep going on. Like, it is nice to be able to keep attacking with this because a lot of times what will happen in the mid game maybe turns four or five, you're, you'll attack with three things, this being one of them, and your opponent goes, okay, they're, they're going to attack with your Mask Maker, they just want to get one final hit in, maybe they want to get one more Disguised Creature, but then it's going to die. Well, then you cast a Combat Trick, your other creatures have gotten in, and they go, oh, well, I didn't expect that. And then, you know, you do the whole thing next turn, maybe even just next turn, it's fine, it dies, but that means your other creatures got unblocked that one turn, and then two turns, you get to do it again, because if you keep casting Disguised Creatures, your opponent's maybe going to go, oh, wow, maybe I really should kill this triple, you know, double block it or something so they're not making mana. And it's actually kind of interesting because I think this is the opposite of Chalk Outline and Insidious Roots and the Drone Smith, where I think people with those cards are a little bit too willing to put it in their deck without the number of things that, that they need. I don't think a lot of people have this card on the radar as a playable card at all. Partially, you kind of think like, oh, what if I draw this in the late game? It's not going to be very good. That is true, but when you're playing an aggressive deck, you care a lot less about what happens if this is the 15th card in my deck, the 20th card in my deck. It matters, but you know, you, you kind of just downplay that a little bit. In the late game, how many 1-2 drops are great when you draw them on turn 10? Very few of them. So it's not like thinking about, okay, will this card be bad as I draw in the late game? No, you're comparing it to any other given 1 or 2 drop, which also is not going to be fantastic in the late game. And I would argue that the upside of when you do start with the Goblin Mask Maker into a disguised creature is better than most 1 or 2 drops in this format. Always a cost-benefit analysis, right? It's never just like the downside or the upside. You're, you're always weighing the two. Next up, we've got Crime Novelist. This is the 3 mana red creature. It's a 1-3. Then whenever you sacrifice an artifact, you put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Crime Novelist and add a red. I think this one's pretty bad. And, and this is one I think people do you put in their deck too often and when I say too often I, I mean I almost mean it all to be honest because not only do you need a lot of cards to make this card worth a card right to, to trigger it I don't think triggering it once is good enough because then you've basically played a three mana two three that let one of your clues crack for a single mana I think you need to have two things to make it a three five that added two mana so you crack one clue for free as a way to look at it and even still, that's not amazing. Like, I think your average three mana card or disguise creature is going to be better than this. I, I think people see this card as they're drafting blue-red maybe and go, oh yeah, yeah, this, this does the thing my deck is doing. But, but that's the other axis too, right? It's two axes. It's like, how many things do you need for this to, to work, to actually trigger? And how good is the payoff? Crime Nautilus is the worst of both worlds where it's... It needs a lot of things. Like, you need to trigger it at least twice. I would say up maybe even close to three times. And the payoff is okay. It's just kind of fine. So I don't think this is an absolutely unplayable card, but you would have to have a lot of things that, that trigger this card. I think you'd have to have, you know, a bunch of clue makers. You'd have to have gear drakes. You'd have to have the drone smiths, the satchels. It, it needs a lot. And then it just becomes like a 20 or 23rd card you could play. Now, what I am interested in for my blue-red decks or just any decks that are making a lot of clues is the case of the Tilch Falcon. This is the single blue mana case that comes in and investigates. To solve it, you control three or more artifacts. And the solve, the bonus is it has the ability to a blue, sacrifice escapes, put four plus one plus one creatures on target non-creature artifact. It becomes a zero zero creature with flying. So it becomes a four four flyer basically. And this card is quite good. You need to, again, do the thing two times because this one spots you one clue and you need two more artifacts. I will say this plays very nicely with Gleaming Gear Drake. The one one flyer that comes in makes a clue and then whenever you sack an artifact, you put a counter on the Gear Drake because you go this into Gear Drake. Well, you've already got there. You've already got three artifacts. And that does bring up another point, right? There are some cards that do the thing twice 
place, right? It kind of counts doubly so. Although when I say doubly so, I want to be careful about that because it's not like you can just like, like say your deck needs eight of the thing to make it work. It's not like it counts for two necessarily because the way I think about it is when you've got a random stack of 40 cards, your deck, you're really thinking about how likely is that you draw some of those over the course of the game or multiple of them over the course of the game. Yes, it does help a little bit. Kind of get, this is where you kind of can cheat a little bit. So this card in particular, I, I said you needed to trigger it twice. So you need two, two clues, two artifacts. So if you have eight artifacts in your deck, I think that's okay. Maybe closer to nine, maybe. But let's say just, you know, not that you're going to get this very often, almost ever. But if you had five gear drakes, yeah, that would be enough. And then another case here, the case of Pilfered Proof. This is the white one that uh, cares about detectives. Whenever a detective enters the battlefield under your control or is turned face up, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it. To solve it, you control three or more detectives. And the solve case is if one or more tokens would be created under your control, those tokens plus a clue are created instead. And I think this one's pretty bad too. This one's kind of like Crime Novelist where it's the worst of, of all the worlds. And it's kind of timing specific because you do want to play this early on. If it's if you top deck this, I mean, it's okay, maybe. But even still, like the, the solve condition is not particularly good. Like sometimes it'll, you've got a bunch of novice inspectors and you're like, great, I make two clues off of those. But it's not like I need to put cards in my deck to make my novice inspectors better. And, and you do need a lot of detectives to make this work. Three on the battlefield. And just like some of the other cards we talked about, that can be disrupted, right? It's not just like, okay, you're going to draw three over the course of the game. You're going to draw three over the course of the game, and they need to survive. And the payoff's not that great. So, so I actually think this is a card you should basically never play. I think if you had all detectives, if you had 16 detectives, I would play it. But even then, I don't think it would be amazing. And then one more here, Case File Auditor. This is the three mana, one four detective at Uncommon that when ETBs look at the top six cards of your library, you can take an enchantment from among them, put it into your hand, put the rest in the bottom in any order, and you can spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast cases. Oh, sorry. Also, if you solve a case, you, you that trigger goes off again. And, and this one is a little bit different on the math. It's not how many are you going to see over the course of the game. It's What's an acceptable hit rate for this? And I think at about six enchantments, you have 80%. Like, I, these numbers at the top of my head. Forgive me if I, I'm fudging these a little bit. But I think you need about six enchantments in your deck to have a, a good enough hit rate. Like, so, like say you did have a chalk outline deck. Like, an Obzon chalk outline deck. That's actually kind of cool. I might try that out. <laughs> that's, that's I, I haven't thought about that before. Putting case file auditor in your uh, in your chalk outline Insidious Root decks. But, but anyways, like... If your deck is built around chalk outline and you're playing case file auditor just to make sure you see it a little more often, I don't think that's good enough. Like if that's the only enchantment or one of two, it's just going to be a one for a little bit too often. So you do need to make sure your, your hit rate is high enough for this. And yeah, I would say about six enchantments before you're very happy. And then I do have one more build around for the memers and the dreamers out there. And that's living conundrum this is the five mana two, four hex proof that if you have no cards in your library, and you draw a card, you don't lose. And if you have no cards in your library, it's a 10-10 flying vigilance creature. So I wouldn't have brought this up if I didn't nearly lose to it. <laughs> so uh, I went to Mark's house, my set review partner, Mark Anderson's house, for a Pro Tour testing draft the other day. And I ended up 3 0 the pod, sick brags, I know. But the finals, my finals opponent, uh, he he's known as somebody who, he's a bit of a brewer, somebody who likes to uh, play some you know, off-the-wall decks. And he had legitimately what I would consider one of the best Living Conundrum decks I I've ever seen. And now, mind you, I haven't seen that many <laughs> Living Conundrum decks. But it was scary. It consistently did the thing. And I don't think the formula is too complicated for it. You have to be some combination of salt tie and just care about every card that self-mills. Like, he had Fester Leeches and Rubble Belt Mavericks. Aftermath Analyst, which is the two mana, one three that ETBs mills three. And you pay four mana to sacrifice it. Return all land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. You're really just trying to mill yourself as quick as possible. And then and then you rebuy Living Conundrum with uh, Macabre Reconstruction, which is the four mana, buy two things back from your graveyard. Or you reanimate it with either It Doesn't Add Up, which is the five mana return target creature to the battlefield and suspect it. Or if you're very lucky, Victimize, which is the list card, three mana, sorcery, choose two creature cards in your graveyard, sack a creature, bring those two creatures that you targeted back. Or there's also Illicit Masquerade, which is a, a weird enchantment, uh, reanimation spell, four mana flash enchantment that comes in, you put an imposter counter on each creature you control, and then whenever a creature you control with an imposter counter dies, you exile it and then return a card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So that's another little reanimation spell. So there's a lot of white ways to buy things back from the graveyard. And yeah, the, the deck is basically just filled with removal so you can interact, a bunch of self mill, and it, it, it was really scary. It went off and he reanimated a living conundrum on turn, I would say seven a lot of the time. Now, every single card in his deck 
was there to put cards in the graveyard. Fairy Snoop is actually another one that you can play to put cards in the graveyard and dig you to your important cards. But if, if all these pieces come together, and again, if you're a memer and a dreamer, I would recommend this. I think it's there. I don't think it's a strategically great thing to do. Like, I would, I'm not just saying, like, oh, this is a secret deck that nobody's drafting. But it's also not the kind of build around where I'm like, no, 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 you should never go for this. It's, it's never going to work. All right, moving on to our next category here. Those top player cards, the cards that are performing better in the hands of top players than they are in the hands of the rest of the community. And it's a lot of green cards. Like I mentioned, I think good players are just drafting these green mid-range, multicolor, graveyard decks. These decks have a few more moving pieces than just, say, like a red-white aggro deck. And actually, as I want to point something out about the red-white aggro decks is that I've seen a lot of really mopey red-white aggro decks on, on the ladder in Mythic. And I've just had green cards flying around the table and no no red cards, no white cards. I think that it's very overdrafted at this point. I, I think people have kind of just heard the, the narrative that this is just like a red-white aggro form and that's what you should draft. And I think like on average four people are trying to fight for that at the table and I'm just we wheeling all some black, green, and blue cards. I'm not trying to say that red-white is bad. And if you are at a table that has red-white open, great, that's fantastic. But uh, if you're somebody who's been approaching the format as like, oh yeah, I just want to get into red white, I'm just gonna be, be drafted. Like I'm heavily biasing towards that. I definitely wouldn't, because I think this is a format that right now, at least, and just in general, is pretty wide open. I don't think that even you know the worst colors are not that much worse than the the better colors. I think that white is a color that I'm still very willing to get into because it's very deep. Even if you're fighting for it with a, a lot of other people, you still end up with a pretty good pile of white cards. Red though, I I think is a color that is not that deep, and when three people are trying to be in red, you end up in a pretty tough spot where you just don't get a lot of good red cards. So some of the cards that I already mentioned, Topiary Panther, uh, we've got the uh, Vichugazi Inspector, Bite Down on Crime, which is the green removal spell. One I want to call out is Tunnel Tipster. This is the two mana one one that taps to add a green mana. And if a face down creature enters the battlefield under your control this turn, you put a plus one plus one counter on Tunnel Tipster. I think the reason this is performing better in the hands of top players than the rest of the community is you really do want to be doing the thing with this. You want to be playing a face down creature on turn three. One of the best ones, by the way, is a Nervous Gardener, the one that uh, you can go flip up and go get a land because you get to go play this on two, Nervous Gardener on three, counter on the tipster, flip right away, kind of nice little sequence. But anyways, I think that if you don't have upwards of four, five, six, seven disguise creatures, I think, you know, really at a minimum of uh, three or four, you don't really want this card that much because it just stays a two mana one one. Sure, it ramps you, but if your opponent then answers the things that you're that you ramp into, this is just gonna stick around and do nothing. So you need your two mana creature to retain relevance as the game goes on. Even if, if this was just a two two, I wouldn't mind. That's easy to trade off with something, but it's just staying as a one one. That's not very good. So it is quite good if you do have a lot of disguise creatures, but it's not really a card you really want otherwise. And then Flourishing Bloonkin. This is the two mana zero zero. It gets plus one plus one for each forest you control. Has disguise for five mana. When it fa uh, flips face up, you get two forest cards. Reveal them. Put one onto the battlefield, one into your hand. I think this is just a, a matter of good players know that you really want to be green heavy when you play this card. It's never going to be a terrible card if you're you know just like split down the middle two colors. But I think that most of the time you want this in a heavy green deck. I would also say top players probably prioritize surveil lands with this card a little more often because not only can this fix you for something other than green if you have a surveil land to go get with this, but also it's really nice that when you flip this up you get the the surveil trigger it just gives it a little more value. So I, I think that's kind of the explanation for that one. And by the way, this is a really good card. It, it's one of the better green uncommons. Then we've got a handful of blue cards here. First one I want to talk about is unauthorized exit. This is the bounce spell two mana for an instant return target non land permanent to its owner's hand. You surveil one and I. I think bounce spells just in general in any format are going to be the type of card that perform better in the hands of good players than of not so good players because it's not just you cast this card and it does its thing like any card that isn't just I cast this and here's the effect plug and play I know what I'm getting is going to perform better in the hands of good players because they know how to strategically use them better and bounce spells especially I think that a lot of players just kind of fire them off whenever like okay bounce before a drop all right, well, you're down a card. You don't really want to do that. You want to be getting some sort of advantage out of casting your bounce spell. Now, mind you, I just that example I just used, you are getting some sort of an advantage. You're getting a tempo advantage, right? You're, you're trading two mana for their four mana. That is not worth the cost of going down a card. 
is you trade your two mana for like a six mana card like they flip up a bubble smuggler on turn six yeah that's actually pretty that's probably going to be worth it because that's almost like time walking them so that's one use of it you really want to be trading way up on mana but the other things I i'm saving this for double blocks right where they I i'm pressuring them and they go for a double block i get my card out of the deal or they go for a combat trick and you bounce in response you really want to be kind of picky about when you cast this card and then two counter spells here reasonable doubt and repulsive mutation reasonable doubt is the two mana instant counter target spell unless their controller pays two Repulsive Mutation is the blue-green X one that puts X counters on target creature you control, and then you counter one target spell unless its controller pays mana equal to the greatest power amongst creatures you control. And counter spells are the same thing as bounce spells. I think just they're going to play better in the hands of a good player because you effectively use a counter spell uh, two things. It's, it's, a, it's a deck building thing and it's a gameplay thing. It's a deck building thing because counter spells just don't go in every deck. You want them in decks where you're holding up mana or decks where you're getting on board very early, right? Because if you can get on board early, not fall behind, and then be able to keep this up for their more impactful cards, that's really nice. But if you're already falling behind, maybe your deck's curve isn't as nice as you'd like it, your opponent's just going to be ahead of you uh, in general, and you need to tap out to just kind of keep pace with your what your opponent's doing, you're not going to have a chance to counter their expensive 5 or 6 or 7 drop, because you're going to have to have tapped out effect of the board so that you didn't just die. But, but also just in game, I think good players know when they can leave up mana, when they can afford to leave up mana for a turn, when they're kind of already ahead on board. Because sometimes you're playing against an opponent who hasn't done anything, they're just holding up mana. And I'll go, huh, all right. Like, you know, a, lot, a pretty common play pattern will be like, my opponent plays their land on two, holds up, you know, blue and a red. And I, at the end, they're, they're hoping that I play the two drop. And instead, I, I wanted to cycle my Topiary Panther. So I, I pass the turn, they pause, they go, okay, I go to my turn. And I cycle my Topiary Panther at the end of their turn. Because they, they've left mana up on turn 3 as well, hoping to counter my 3-drop. And that, then that kind of raises a red flag for me. Because I'm like, okay, what hand did they keep that they didn't have a 2, they didn't have a 3? What's going on here? And sometimes I'll play around it, right? I'll, I'll just play a Rubble Belt Maverick. I'll play a 1-drop instead of playing my 2. Or maybe I'd play a Novice Inspector on turn 1. I'll spend the turn cracking my clue. Just make it awkward for the opponent. Because by the time they get to turn 4, if they're then still leaving up mana, then it's like... All right, then you can pretty confidently say that they have a reasonable doubt. So it's easy to read a player who isn't thinking about when they can hold up the mana or, or not even that, when it's obvious that they're holding up the mana waiting to counter something. On that note, one thing I would really uh, point out is that when your opponent's been holding up mana in the early game and then on turn four, they play a two drop and leave up two mana. Well, what's more likely that they just drew that two drop or that they have reasonable doubt in their hand and they're holding that up as well. Probably that they had reasonable doubt in their hand. So uh, it's kind of all, you know, kind of ties together. It's that good players are building decks with good curves so that they're getting on board first so that they can then hold the reasonable doubt up later or they're playing decks with instants in them so if they, their opponent didn't cast anything and didn't play into the reasonable doubt, they can cast something else. They can count a bounce spell, a draw spell, a deduce, crack a clue. Same thing goes for Repulsive Mutation. I'm going to go a little bit deeper on Repulsive Mutation next week, I think. Next week is going to be the gameplay episode, so stick around for that one because uh, Repulsive Mutation is kind of an interesting card to play because that, that adds another layer of like, well, should I just cast this card? Should I just cast it for, you know, as a combat trick? So like I said, kind of a lot of the same stuff as Reasonable Doubt, but uh, has a little more play to it. And then Push Pull. This is the split card white orzov hybrid sorcery destroy tar target tapped creature and pull is for rakdos hybrid rakdos hybrid sorcery put two cards from a single graveyard onto your battlefield they gain haste and you exile them at the end step i think a lot of people look at this card as solid removal and this maybe you cast a six mana card but i see this as an aggro finisher more than anything because i actually don't think the removal spells side of this is that great i see that as the buyout where it's just like, okay, two mana sorcerer speed, kill a tap creature. That's that's just not very good. It's passable, but it's not a removal spell I, I'm really into. Pull, though, is a really good aggro finisher. I, I had, you know, that same uh, match I was talking about a few minutes ago against the Living Conundrum player. They had this card in their deck, and I was playing blue-green. And early in the game, I cycled to Topiary Panthers. And, and I was at 20, I was beating down, and I was, and, and there was one turn where I was tapped out, and, uh, no, no, tapped out of creatures and tapped out of lands. And they go, oh, you're tapped out? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, okay, I think you're dead. <laughs> I'm like, what? how am I dead? And they reanimated my two panthers and just bashed me for the full 20 with some other creatures. So, yeah, th this is a real sick card. Because you sometimes you get the panthers. Sometimes you get creatures with good enter the battlefield effects. You can often have something pretty good with this card. All right, now moving on to some niche cards that you might play sometimes. So, I have a big group of black cards here. And they all kind of 
belong in the same camp of, of black aggro and black aggro is a deck that i've been drafting more and more either white black or red black and there's a lot of cards that are not particularly strong and do definitely don't go in the grindy black decks and i think sometimes make their way into those decks and are bringing in the stats of these cards overall i don't think these cards are amazing but i think that when you pair them in a package they do become something a little bit more than the sum of their parts. So if you're just looking at black cards and 17 lands and how good they are or just how you know how bad they are is, is a little more accurate because they are not performing as well as some of the other colors. I think for a card that you look at can go, oh, that, that could be played in a black aggro deck. It's probably a little bit better than it, it might seem just the aggregate stats. And in fact, when you sort by white, black and red, black, I think a lot of these cards do get a little bit better. So just, you know, leading down a list here of some of those cards. We've got something like Toxin Analysis, single black mana for an instant. Target creature against death touch and lifelink until on turn. You investigate. Repeat Offender. This is two mana for the 2-1 that you can pay three mana to suspect it. And if it's already suspected, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it. We've got Alley Assailant. This is the three mana, three, three that ETB is tapped. It's also got Disguise for six mana. When it's turn face up, your opponent loses three life and you gain three life. Clandestine Meddler. It's a three mana, three, two at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you suspect one creature you control. And then whenever one or more suspected creatures attack, you surveil one. Uh, Night Drinker Moroi is the five mana, four, two flying creature that has Disguise for black, black. When it enters the battlefield, you lose three life. So you can kind of see like this package where I think what's happening a lot of the time is people are just like throwing these cards in in some black mid-range decks. It's just like they don't make sense at all. Like these cards are really really terrible at blocking like you really never want to suspect something in, in a slower black deck and you never really want to play an alley assailant as a tap three three but as aggressive cards these cards are not the worst and, and two cards that look really really bad but i actually do think i have a place are lead pipe and polygraph orb so lead pipe is the single black mana clue equipment sacks to draw a card pay two like all these the equipped creature gets plus two plus oh and whenever the equipped creature dies each opponent loses one life so this card is good on Menace Creatures. It's good on a Snarling Gorehound. It's really good on a Life Linker. So something like Sanguine Savior, the white black disguise creature at common. Put on that, drain them for four. Like this rate is, is probably the best rate out of all these equipment. Just single black mana to play, two mana to equip, plus two, plus so. That's not so bad. And that when it dies, your opponent loses his life. Like that tax on a little bit too. There's also Polygraph Orb. And this one's a really strange one. This is five mana, four and a black for an artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you look at the top four cards of your library, put two of them to your hand and the rest in the graveyard, you lose two life. And then it has two and tap, collect evidence three. Each opponent loses three life unless they discard a card or sacrifice a creature. Again, another card that's really bad in a slow grindy deck because you don't want to tap out five mana, lose two life just to draw two cards. A lot of your other cards give you value. You don't have to play this card. But at the top end, after you've emptied your hand and you get to gas back up in a black aggro deck and that activated ability pretty relevant right just really starts to pressure your opponent so i don't think these black aggro decks are some of the better decks in the format but you are going to have spots in your drafts where you see okay black is pretty open maybe you started your draft with a vein ripper right the, the six five flying mythic three black 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 whenever something dies your opponent loses two life and you gain two life or with the, the hunted bone brute that's the disguise screw to the six two menace that uh, if you just cast it your opponent makes two one one tokens but if you flip a face up that doesn't happen and when it dies your opponent loses three life like if you first pick those, I think this is something you can move into, especially because so many of these cards are not cards you, you, anybody really values highly at all, especially like the lead pipe and the polygraph orb. It's just another tool in your tool belt, and especially if you are drafting a pod that's kind of difficult. Maybe you're at a high-level draft. You know, I'm going to uh, the MagicCon Chicago this weekend, and there's a, there's a PT company you're going to be playing in. I, I imagine that this is going to be a good tool in your tool belt if you're playing in that, because people are going to know that the green mid-range and the white aggro decks are good and people are also going to on average in a strong pod draft black a little bit less so this is something that you know i'm definitely going to keep in my back pocket and i think you should too if you are planning to play in something that is a little more high level than just your random you know arena best of one two green cards that are kind of niche kind of interesting kind of weird but uh, kind of have the same vibe to them so aftermath analyst this is the one i mentioned a few minutes ago one in a green for a one three etb's mill three Pay four mana to sack it to return all lands from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. And they went this way. This is the three mana sorcery 
Look for a basic land, put it on the battlefield, tap, and investigate. So I do like Analyst a bit more than they went this way. Analyst is just kind of a, an okay card if you do care about self mill, if you're doing chalk outline stuff. But the, the four mana ability, like you kind of ask yourself, when do you have time for that? And the same thing goes with, with they went this way. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm tapping out three mana, not affecting the board just to get a land and a clue. Well, you know, but if you're, the, the problem with this card isn't that it doesn't give you enough value, it's that you're not doing anything. And, and so you might not have all the time in the world to, to crack that clue. Uh, where I play these cards the most is when you have have expensive cards that are very good at catching you up because then you can stomach not affecting the board directly the turn that you go for the aftermath analyst or you cast they went this way with aftermath analyst you do want to be playing it in a deck that has other ways to get cards into a graveyard because I think you really want to get back three lands. Two lands is a, is a bare minimum with this card. And the idea, of course, is you go like on turn four, you block, sack this, bring back three lands. Because then if you do have seven mana in play after that, you start to have some pretty good turns. Only if you have good top end that stabilizes you, though. So I, I'm thinking a killer among us or good rares or something that comes in and kills a creature. They went this way is very similar. I play they went this way a lot of the time when I have a killer among us because going three into a killer among us, the killer among us stabilizes you and you don't feel so bad about casting this on turn three. Another nice little combo is this and cornered crook. This is the five mana five four in red that when it ETBs you sacrifice an artifact to deal three to something. Well, this gives you an artifact and ramps you into it. Next up, we've got Behind the Mask. This is a single blue mana instant that you can cast it and collect evidence six. Until on turn, target creature or artifact becomes an artifact creature with base power and toughness four three. And if evidence is collected, instead it has one one. So basically, you cast it as a weird pump spell if you don't collect evidence or you turn your opponent's creature into a one one for the turn if you do. This is not a card I think you should almost ever play but if you are a red-blue deck, or just a deck with a lot of artifacts, I think it becomes a passable 23rd card. The thing you generally want to do with it is animate a clue on defense, because if you animate a clue, it becomes a 4-3. That blocks reasonably well. You ambush them. It's just a good tempo play, right? If you're a little bit behind, one mana to animate something is for a surprise blocker. And, and they can't blow it out in response, of course, because you're targeting a non-creature when, when this first happens. And then if something does go wrong, they have a removal spell in response, or they have, you know, they uh, cast a combat trick to not lose their creature. If you have the mana, you can sack the clue to, to not feel so bad about it. So also kind of has some interesting things going on with the base toughness for three. So if you target a gear drake, the red, blue, and common, it, it'll get plus three power no matter how big it is because it starts as a one one and then puts counters on it. So that's a little bit interesting to get kind of a, a little bit of burst of damage if that matters. Anything that sets its power and toughness, you know, zero, zero. So for example, the, the case of the Filch Falcon, that's another thing that this deals four damage. We just need to do that last four or uh, the, the Bloom Kin. Oh, that's a weird one. I don't think you're going to have like a, a blue green deck with a lot of clues. Although you might, if you have evidence examiners, the, the blue green two drop uncommon and they went this way. It's like, I, I could actually maybe see it there too. Uh, white cards now, due diligence. This is the three mana aura that comes in, gives something plus two, plus two. And the enchanted creature also gets plus two, plus two and both creatures have vigilance. So two things you want with this card. One, one drops. Because you can go one, two, this. That's a nice little push in a black, white aggro deck with the, the menace creatures or, or a fester leech on turn one. Snarling like Gorehound or fester leech, so that's kind of nice. Or you have a lot of disguise creatures. So you can put this in a disguise creature and not get blown out when, when they target it in the mid game. So another card that I, I don't think is a great playable, but as a 20 to 23rd card, if you've got a lot of ones, got a lot of disguise creatures, you can throw it in there. Uh, I want to call it Griffnot Tracker here. This is the four mana 3 2 flying detective that comes in, exiles two cards. From a single graveyard i think this is pretty firmly a sideboard card the, the rate itself is not very good but but as i've been playing more best of three i've played this card i don't know if the opponent was maining it or just had it in uh you know brought it in from the sideboard but when i was collecting evidence it, it was a nuisance because i was spending my early turns maybe cycling a panther putting stuff in my graveyard and what i described earlier where, where really your evidence cards help you regain tempo when you can collect evidence really blunted that effect and i was stuck just playing worse cards than i'd expected to play while they still played a reasonable threat. Again, not an amazing threat, but a reasonable one. So just kind of wanted to call this out as a sideboard card. <laughs> and then last one here, a very weird one, Magnetic Snuffler. This is a five mana, four four at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, return target equipment card from your graveyard to the battlefield, attach it to Magnetic Snuffler. Whenever you sacrifice an artifact, put a plus one plus one counter on Magnetic Snuffler. So this card, you might think, okay, where does this go? Okay, whenever I sacrifice an artifact, sounds like a blue red card. But I think that's the lesser important part of this card. I think the top line is more important. Return equipment from your graveyard to the battlefield. But then you run into another problem where you need good equipment. 
and those don't really exist in this set. But there are two that do send themselves to the grave that I think are playable, and they actually are in the exact opposite color pair as blue red. And I think the place you want Snuffler, and I use want lightly, I think this is again like a thing you can do if you have these cards already, is where you have the Crobot Haunch, the single white mana equipment that uh, you can sacrifice to, to make some dog tokens, or the lead pipe the, that I just mentioned, the plus two black uh, equipment. I think those two are the two most playable equipments that put themselves in the graveyard. So if you have like three of those, again, going back to the splash math, you want one of those things. If you can buy back one of those things after you sacrifice them, I think you're okay with this card. Then it becomes playable, but that's really the only place I think it's it's going to be a card I ever consider. Okay, now moving on to some rares. I'm just going to rapid fire a few things off here. Outrageous Robbery. X Black Black Instant. Target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library face down. You can look at them and play them for as long as they remain exiled. If you cast a spell, so you can spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast it. So this is a card I, I've got a lot of questions about too. And it sort of solves an issue I was talking about last week where the black control decks or the blue control decks and you know sometimes they're blue black I suppose have issues closing the game. There's just not a lot of great finishers. This is a decent one. You know, you either can mill your opponent out if, if you play a really, really long game, but usually you're just going to do it for like X equals five, X equals six. I think closer to X equals six if you can help it because sometimes you just hit some non-impactful spells. But th this is a fine standard for a, a black control finisher. I wouldn't play this in any other deck. It has to be a control deck. You have to get to like eight, nine mana to be, for it to be good. But if you're there, it, it's a way to solve that problem. Cryptics. This is the two mana artifact that taps to collect evidence three to add a mana, then put an unlock counter on Cryptics, then you can sacrifice Cryptics to Severeal three and draw three cards. Activate this only if Cryptex has five or more unlock counters on it. Looks very, very unplayable and mostly is, but I do think if you are a deck that has Chalk Outline and Insidious Roots, this is a way that you can continually trigger that while triggering at the turn that those cards come down. Because that's one of the problems with those cards, right? You're, you're playing them and a lot of times you don't get to trigger them the, the turn it comes down, you've just done nothing. Cryptix gives you something that you invest mana early to be able to do that when the chalk outline comes down, and you screw around the problem of chalk outline not affecting the board of the turn it comes down. This is only going to be playable if you have things that self-mill. You've got Rubble Belt Mavericks, you've got Gore Hounds, you've got the, the Analyst, the one three that mills three and brings back lands from your grave. Like You really have to be self-mill heavy for this to be any a card at all you want to consider, and you probably want to be splashing too, and, and a lot of these uh, you know black-green decks, they, they kind of do lean into blue or base blue-green leaning into black. You're salt a lot of the time. I, I would say proceed with caution with this one, but if you have something in the neighborhood of like six or seven cards that self-mill you, I think you can consider this. All right, next up, I want to call out a little combo here. Prof's Eidetic Memory and Coveted Falcon. I saw this on Sam Black's stream. It was kind of funny. So Prof's Eidetic Memory is two mana. ETBs draw a card. You have no max hand size in the beginning of combat on your turn. If you've drawn more than one card this turn, put X plus one plus one counters and target creature you control where X is the number of cards you've drawn this turn. Minus one. The Falcon is a three mana, one four flyer that has this guy for two mana. It says whenever the Falcon attacks, you gain control of target permanent you own, but don't control. And it says when it's turned face up, target opponent gains control of any number of target permanents you control. Draw a card for each one they gain control of this way. So the eidetic memory is just a good card. Like this is just a, a good good blue card. You should just play this in all your blue decks. Falcon, uh, I think you need a little bit of help. I think it's okay to just to play it, you know, give them a land, get it right back, draw a card when it flips. But uh, I do think you kind of want to combo with stuff like Makeshift Finding, the, the white removal spell, so you can, like, give that to them. You, know, you don't really care if they own the Makeshift Finding, and you can uh, steal it back. But you can one-shot the opponent if you just give them every permanent, <laughs> except for the Falcon, right? You give them all your lands, give them everything else. Of course, they need to be tapped out so that doesn't go wrong, but that's just like, a kind of cool little thing I wanted to point out. And in case of the Locked Hot House, this is an interesting one. Four mana. For a case, three and a green. Static ability, you can play an additional land on each of your turns. To solve it, you control seven or more lands, and the solved ability is really, really good. You can look at the top card of your library anytime. You can play lands, cast creatures, and enchantments from the top. When this gets going, it's really, really hard to just lose. If, if you're stable at all, you start drawing three, four cards a turn. But getting to seven is not trivial. I don't have too much that's complex to say about this card, but I, I do think this is a good card as long as you have enough spells in your deck that can go get you land. So something like Nervous Gardener or the Panther or they went this way. Just as long as I would say five of your spells get lands. And, or if you're 18 lands, that kind of kind of is pseudo uh, another land, right? 
I would play this card. But you don't want to be playing this card if you can't do that, because getting to seven lands just doesn't happen in every game. And that's going to do it for our episode today. Thank you for watching and listening. If you made it this far, like I mentioned, go check out that Patreon. See if there's any rewards over there that interest you, or if you're just interested in supporting the show. Next week, we will be back with a gameplay episode. I think, I think that's what I'm going to nail down for next week, because uh, I do think gameplay is a big, big part of success in this format. And I wanted to cover the card evaluation stuff first, because I think that, you know, the, the way that the building blocks work, I think you can't have that foundation of uh, not knowing what the cards do and what, where you want to play certain cards, and then try to get good at gameplay. I think you need to do the, the card evaluation first, and then the gameplay. So, join us back next week. We'll be talking about some Murder's gameplay. Thanks for watching and listening, everybody. We'll see you next time.